I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week, I'm speaking to Dr. Wilson Wall, who runs Beaudley Orchids and has co-authored a book on growing native orchids in your garden. Dr. Wall tells us how we can utilise these plants in borders, containers, lawns. In fact, they're much more versatile than you probably realise. And not only are they beautiful and unusual, by growing them, you're actually taking part in important work to conserve these plants as the number of plants growing in the wild continues to shrink. Here's Dr. Wall with the lowdown on how to incorporate these stunning plants into your garden, whatever the size of your growing area. I wondered if you could talk a bit about the history of orchid collecting and maybe some of the reasons why these plants are now rare in the wild, specifically in the UK. Well, it it all starts with the fascination of the Victorians with all things tropical. And they were very keen on collecting tropical orchids. It sort of spread from there to the showier British orchids. But the real problems seem to have arisen in the late 19th century with people, gardeners specifically, deciding that they'd like the wild orchids in the garden and they would dig them up. And they were basically dug out from a lot of areas Specifically, the one that really lost out was the lady slipper orchid, which went down to a single plant up in Yorkshire. But more than that, the books that cover this whole process, what they do is they describe cases where areas were picked, routinely picked. And I've been to flower shows where we've had people coming up and saying, I remember when they were really common and we used to go out and pick them. And picking seems to have really damaged the native flora quite considerably. And specifically the orchids, they've disappeared from a lot of places due to that. The other area or the other reason is unfortunately the changes in agriculture. About the middle of the 20th century, when we were digging for victory, And just after the Second World War, when cheap fertilisers and weed killers came on the market, it basically put the nail in the coffin of a lot of areas as suitable for growing native orchids. And they all disappeared. They're not actually very good competitors. That's the real thing. They're messed with by putting fertiliser on in the wild, as you would on a field of wheat. It will drift to the edge where you might have found the orchids and they will disappear because the grasses will outcompete them. So actually, if you were picking them, presumably you're taking away their opportunity to set a seed and to disperse that seed. Is that how they spread? Yes, most of our native species will only spread through seed. There are one or two. There's one called the Tway Blade and the Helleberines as well, where they've got a creeping rhizome and that will spread underground. And you get quite large colonies from a single plant with those, but all the others will only spread from seed. You do talk about propagating them from seed in your book. I think it's quite detailed and we won't go into it here, but it does sound fascinating. And what is it that makes the orchid seeds unique and how do do they overcome this when they're germinating? Well, the reason they're unique is because they are so very, very small. The orchid seeds are the smallest seeds of any plant group. And the reason that they're so small is they have no nutrients in them at all. They might have just a tiny drop of oil in them. And when I say tiny, I really do mean tiny because the orchid seed is pretty well just made up of a bundle of cells, a handful of cells. And they keep this little globule of oil just to metabolize, to keep themselves alive, keep the seed alive. But it can't actually germinate because it doesn't have any nutrients in there. It's not like something like a pea 
where most of what you see, the pea, is actually nutrient material that can feed the root and the shoot as it starts to grow. And the orchid seed doesn't have any of that. And what it relies on in the wild is to be invaded by a fungus, a symbiotic fungus. It invades the cells, actually going into the cells, and starts to provide nutrients for the orchid as it germinates so that it can grow underground, sometimes for several years, without having to put up a shoot. It can be a very, very slow process in the wild. And because the seed has to come into contact with the right fungus, the number of seeds, the proportion of seeds which germinate is also very, very small. A fraction of 1% will germinate. Your book is encouraging people to grow orchids actually in a garden environment. So how would we go about ensuring that that fungus was present? Can we do anything to help the orchid along the way? Well, generally speaking, for some of the species, and especially the ones that we recommend for growing in gardens, the fungus is already in the soil and it's pretty well everywhere. Soil fungi are vital to the health of the soil. So we can pretty sure that for some species, they will grow. They will grow in the soil and they will spread. Once you've got the plants seeding, as long as you're very patient, they will germinate and spread and produce nice swathes of colour at the right time of year. How many orchid species are suitable for cultivation in our garden? The non-specialist, I would put it as only a handful, realistically. There are variations. In general terms, we've only got 50 wild species in this country, in the UK. Of those, some of them are legally protected, so we can't do anything with those. Some of them are very difficult to germinate. Some of them germinate easily, but very difficult to get to grow on to full-size plants. So there's only a small number which are suitable for growing as a routine in the garden. And these are the ones that we try and encourage people to grow because if they get the excitement, and it is exciting, that the plants flowering and then setting seed and flowering again and producing more plants, they might be inclined to try some of the more difficult species. In that way, we can fulfill what we see as one of our major activities, which is conservation. And we're basically encouraging people to help in their gardens to conserve these native plants. Because they're very beautiful plants anyway. They make lovely garden plants, but they're just very, very uncommon in the wild now. Yeah, there's a big debate at the moment, I guess, to say our gardens are becoming little mini nature reserves. They're kind of like the last preserve of habitat for certain things. So it is important that we look to native species and try to get them established and, as you say, conserve them. So if somebody wanted to start growing orchids, what would be a good one to start with and what might it need in a garden situation? The very best to start with, if you've never grown a a native species, the very best is the common spotted orchid. Now, there's a few orchids that have got the name common or got common in the name, but they're not actually very common now. They're widespread and sometimes you'll find quite large colonies of them, but they're not common plants anymore. They're always a surprise when you come across them. And the thing about the common spotted orchid is that it's very easy going as to what species of symbiotic fungus it requires. And it's also very easy going as to what sort of soil it grows in. It'll pretty well grow anywhere. So if you can introduce one of those or some of those into your garden, you can be pretty sure that they will survive. They should be good, solid plants and they will survive. Now, there's some others, if you've got some damp patches, which are very closely related, like the southern marsh orchid. And that, again, that's a very easygoing plant but it doesn't need to be in a situation where it won't dry out. It doesn't need to be wet, but it just must be in a situation where it won't get its roots dried out in the summer. And do they all need sunshine? Yes, pretty well. There are some woodland species that variously need different degrees of shade and do very well in shade, but they're actually surprisingly difficult to cultivate. They tend to be very much slower 
uh, germinating and growing on. So we tend not to grow very many of those. One of them is the butterfly orchid. It's a beautiful white orchid. One of our few, in fact, white orchids. I've never seen it in anything other than white. You sometimes get colour variations in a number of species, but never seen a butterfly orchid except white. And it does very well in woodland areas, but it's ever so slow growing. So it does take a lot of patience and a lot of time. And uh, it's very easily disturbed. And once it's in the ground, it's pretty well impossible to move it because its roots are so deep. You can't dig it out, especially because it grows in woodland. Its roots are all tangled up with the tree roots and the shrubs that are growing around it. That is a really beautiful plant, actually. So if you were thinking of establishing a colony of something like that, I'm guessing it's going to be a bit of an exercise in patience and a question of leaving things alone, which for some gardeners, they might find a bit of a temptation to go and tweak beds here and there. I guess you've already answered the question of whether they kind of play nicely with other plants. It doesn't sound as if they do suffer too much competition. But is there anything that might grow nicely with, say, the butterfly orchid? Yes. In fact, one of the surprising things that we've come across and we've developed is that people like growing their hostas in pots, big pots and containers, and they tend to leave them in the pots for several years undisturbed. And things like the southern marsh orchids really like almost exactly the same conditions as your hostas do. So if you grow hostas in a container or in a flower bed and you leave them alone as people often do, you can grow your sort of marsh orchids with them, around them, in amongst them, and they'll do very, very well indeed. And they do make a rather startling display because you do get the the lovely leaves of the hostas, uh, which will produce also their tall flowers. But earlier in the year, you'll get these lovely spikes of purple coming up, which are your southern marsh orchids, which are just sharing the space quite happily. And are they as susceptible to slugs as the hostas might be? No, no, they're not. In fact, if you have a big problem with slugs and snails, they might graze the hosta down to ground level, but you'll generally find that your orchids survive. That's good to know. Yeah, I was amazed to hear that they can grow in containers. How many of the species would be suitable for that? And is that easy to do? Yes, it is. What we've done, because we tend to grow quite a range of them commercially, we tend to grow them in pots. They do very well. They are a little bit susceptible to either overwatering or underwatering. So you have to be a little bit careful how they're watered. But generally speaking, they do very well in pots. They do tend to need quite large pots because their roots are few but very long. Consequently, you need a a nice big pot for them. Once they're in a container or a pot, they do very nicely. Am I right in thinking that a lot of them need chalky soils to grow? They do very well in chalky soils, yes. Things like the pyramidal orchid and the bee orchid do very well in chalky soils, but they don't, strictly speaking, they don't need to grow on chalky soils. We're tending to find that for a lot of these species, it's more about the competition of the material that's growing with them that causes them problems. And chalky soils, as you might find on the South Downs, for example, are such poor soils that the surrounding foliage doesn't do very well. And consequently, the orchids survive nicely. But it doesn't mean that that's the only place they'll grow. We've got, or we've had, self-set pyramidal orchids growing on our acid clay in our garden. The seed has just come off our potted pyramidal orchids and it started growing in our clay soil. And also we have a meadow which is almost purely sandstone-based soil. And it's very poor. There's very little organic material in it and it's acid. So it's basically it's an acid sand. And one of the species that does very well up there is a pyramidal orchid. And that is at the other end of the extreme. Again, it's probably doing well because the other plants don't have enough nutrients in the soil to do any severe competition to the pyramidal orchid. 
so the pyramidal orchid can thrive under those circumstances. So if you were going to plant them in a container, would you make any concessions to that preference for chalky soil or what would you plant them into in a container? What we tend to do is John Innes number two and something almost up to 25% garden lime and also grit just to make sure it doesn't settle down and stop draining. We have common spotted orchids around where I am and they grow in the most unpromising situations in really thick clay, you know, and they pop up reliably and and it's waterlogged in the winter. They must be really tough. Yes, once they're established, they are very, very robust plants. How long do they live for? Because And another question, I suppose, for gardeners is how long do they flower for? Well, flowering time is usually something between a month and six weeks. So it's not a very long flowering period. But in terms of how long they live, we know that the southern marshes and the common spotted orchids easily survive for between 15 and 20 years. They're really quite long-lived individual plants. Some of the other ones are supposed to be a bit shorter, but we think this is possibly because they tend to disappear underground and go dormant for a year or two and pop up again. And we've talked about slugs. Are there any other common pests and diseases that you might need to look out for? Not really. Being wild plants, they're very well adapted to whatever we've got in our environment. There are one or two bacterial diseases which can cause problems for them. But the only way of dealing with those is to actually root the plant up and try and clean it off, get rid of the infected leaves and then replant it and just hope it survives. It's not a very easy disease to control. But generally speaking, they don't have much of a problem with pests and diseases. One of the more amusing pests, if you like, are deer. Because what they will do, especially muntjacs, is they will just snip off the flowers. And I think that's probably because they're after the nectar and the flower just tastes sweet. But it actually looks as though someone's just snipped off the flower with a pair of scissors, just nipped off cleanly. And it's the muntjacs that do it. Oh, I expect many a jealous neighbour has been blamed for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose the question is, why aren't we all growing them? They sound fantastic. But if we did want to get hold of some, I imagine there are some things to look out for when you are sourcing them. So where's the best place to buy them? And is it best to buy seeds or plants? I would always advise people not to buy seed. Getting them to germinate is quite a technical task. And Basically, it's really quite difficult. Buying plants is the best way of doing it because once the plant's established, then it will be producing its own seed. You can have every expectation that the seed will start to germinate all on its own given time. But you've got to get your plants in the first place. Now, occasionally you see some of the species at some garden centers. They're fine. They're perfectly okay. But if they're not a species, you might find that they don't produce viable seed. The plants themselves will be quite lovely and they'll have lovely flowers, but the seeds might not be viable. If you grow plants that are species and you want to get them to produce their own seeds and germinate, then you've got to go to a specialist grower, of which there aren't very many about. There's laneside orchids in the north of England and Budley orchids, of which I am a path. But there aren't actually very many growers of native species suitable for putting into gardens and meadows and recolonizing areas. And given the over collecting that's happened historically, are there any red flags? Is there anything people definitely need to look out for or shouldn't do when they're purchasing them? Well, certainly if somebody's selling them and it looks as though they've come from the wild, then definitely not. That really shouldn't be encouraged. But generally speaking, that doesn't happen. What we do find occasionally is people seem to have dug them up and taken them away. That's quite distressing because you can be sure that they've probably killed them in the process because they're really a problem of the roots. The roots have to be very delicate. There's not many of them. So they have to be treated with a great deal of care. But generally speaking, if you can get a grown plant, a cultured plant, and get it into the ground and it survives the first winter, then uh, it'll be established and 
it'll be yours for a long, long time. <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm guessing as we've spoken about meadow and woodland areas, I presume they are the best kind of environment apart from the containers in the garden. Are there any other environments that we could potentially hone them where they'd be happy? You can put them in borders quite easily, but the thing about that is that you've got to make sure that you're not going to disturb the border. That's the thing. It needs to be kept as a border in exactly the same condition because these plants really don't like being disturbed a great deal. What people quite often do is they naturalise them into their lawns. That's always a great treat and a good excuse not to mow your lawn. Yeah, I was just going to say, do you have to leave them as you would daffodils, for example, for the foliage to die down before you would mow? Yes, yes, you do. If you've got them in your lawn, then you just wait until they've set seed and then you just run the mower over them. Yeah, easy peasy. As I said, I don't know why we're not all growing them. It's it's crazy. So where can people find out more about you? And could you just give us the title of your book and where people can get hold of that too? Yes, certainly. The book is called How to Grow Native Orchids in Gardens Large and Small. And it's available from Amazon or from Green Books, who are the publisher. You can order them from bookshops as well, because Green Books is a big publisher. So it's got quite a wide distribution. And if they wanted to reach out to you or to Beaudley Orchids, do you have a website? I do indeed. Yes, it's beaudleyorchids.com. Simple as that. It was a pleasure to speak to Dr Wall and thank you to him for taking the time to tell us all about native orchids. And of course, thanks to you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.